Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 1019th New Social Environment. I'm Chloe Stagaman, Director of Programs here at The Rail, and I have the extreme joy of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Clarity Haynes and Dr. Ksenia M. Sobliva. And now I'll introduce today's guest and host. Born in 1971 in McAllen, Texas, and based in Brooklyn and upstate New York, Clarity Haynes is known for her longstanding explorations of the torso as a site for painted portraiture works in her breast chest portrait project, always painted from life and usually monumental in scale, have focused on themes of healing, trauma, and self-determination. Feminist and queer craft practices are often honored in her work. Bright colors, lively compositions, and multiple narratives conjoin in the depictions of both bodies and altars. Her work has been exhibited widely, including at the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum, New Discretions, and the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery, among many others. And our host today, Dr. Ksenia M. Sobaliva, is a New York-based art historian specializing in queer art and culture. She holds a PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU with a dissertation on art, AIDS, and lesbian identity in the United States. Sobaliva is currently working on a book project titled Friendship as a Way of Art, Queer Identity and Visual Citation, and co-editing with Svetlana Kito, the first major publication on the lesbian gallery Trial Bloom. Her writings have appeared in Bomb Magazine, Hyperallergic, Ursula, and of course, the Brooklyn Rail. And she's also contributed to various exhibition catalogs and artist monographs. She teaches at the New School at NYU, and we're so lucky to have her here today as host. And I'm going to pass it over to Ksenia to get us started. Thank you so much, Chloe, and thank you to everyone at the Brooklyn Rail for making this possible. It is always a pleasure. And thank you, Clarity, for joining me today. I am so delighted to be in conversation with you. Um, we've known each other for a few years now, and I actually still remember when I first started publishing art writing. Um, this must have been around 2018. And uh, I don't remember which article, but probably something about lesbian visibility. And somebody messaged me and said, oh my God, Clarity Haynes just retweeted your, your article. And I wasn't, and I'm not on Twitter, but it was such, a, I remember it was such a compliment and uh, a, a stamp of recognition. And you are so good at highlighting other Thank artists, you. queer artists and writers and bringing community together. And so I am very, very happy to be here celebrating you today and congratulations on your on your solo show. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right into this new body of work and 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 we can um, we can start the slideshow so that people can um, see the work uh, for those who haven't visited the show yet. So you know, I have to say, as somebody who is absolutely terrified by the idea of giving birth and has no desire to do so, and uh, somebody who, you know, kind of recently reached a point in my life where I simply could no longer pretend that I think babies are cute. Um, so I, when I when I first learned about about your crowning series. Um, I was intrigued and and also nervous. And uh, you know, there's recently been been a rise in in scholarship on queer motherhood and queer parenthood at large. And uh, and I am really happy to observe from the sidelines, uh, but it is not a dialogue that that I inhabit, right? So I was like, all right, let's, you know, I, I was a little nervous. And then I saw your paintings and I realized that actually. This has nothing to do with motherhood at all. Uh, it's really about birth without motherhood, and I would even go as far as to say that perhaps it's perhaps it's not even about birth. It's about something emerging from inside a hole, uh, and we should go to some some close-ups as well so that people can see. And our our dear friend Leah Devon, who's in the audience, uh, writes about these that that you are disrupting the idea of birth as a heroic culmination of heterosexual union and instead you're concentrating on the on its potential for queer eroticism and, and i'm quoting leah here um 
And so, and even though the babies are emerging from vaginas, there's also a real, um, a real analogy to this, which then makes me think of Julia Kristeva's idea of the abject and her essay, The Powers of Horror. And, you know, she says that the abject is, is all about this conflation and confu a confusion between the internal and external and, and that, that, that which is within and outside the self. Um, but at the same time, I'm going to stop talking in a second, but at the same time, there is also something really funny about these, right? And we talked about that a little bit. Um, these images of, of, of us being squeezed, there's something so funny that we're like being squeezed into the world and, and good fucking luck. Uh, and something really, there's something really campy about that. And so I look at these works and I'm like, this is Yulia Kristeva and Susan Sontag having a cup of tea. Or maybe <laughs> I would go even, even further and say, if they were painters and they had a baby. Um, so all this leads me to the question, what made you turn to crowning? And um, why did you, how did you become interested in this phenomenon? Well, first of all, I have really just enjoyed listening to you just now. Um, I love everything you said. Thank you. It is such a joy to hear someone have right off the bat a really expansive view and not a literal one on this work. Um, basically, I've, all, you know, like you, I've never, even though it was pushed on me, the idea of birth was pushed on me since I was a baby. Um, you know, I've never been interested in, um, you know, in being a mother, having, you know, a child. And I was always told, oh, you'll change your mind when you grow up, but that didn't happen. Um, and instead, uh, I came out and, you know, when I came out, there was not gay marriage. There was not a lot of queer people having kids. And if they did, it was often from previous straight marriages or from, um, adoption. So the idea of biological birth happening with queer people, much less trans people, was very rare. Um, so I feel like for me, um, it's also generational in, in a sense, like the perspective that I'm coming from. Because um, it really, I think I probably learned as much from seeing the movie Alien when I was a child as I did from having any personal cultural connection with the idea of, um, of birth except for the fact that I was curious that I never saw it. I was curious that like movies would show someone about to give birth and then cut away. Um, and when I was 21, my stepmother gave birth to my half brother and I was there. And I, and, I, and I was shocked at how different it was from what I had seen in the movies where it was like people who were giving birth were always kind of like, they seemed like they were at the mercy of something, almost like victims. You know, she was very kind of like, she was doing this, you know? Um, and I, and I thought it was quite exciting and it actually reminded me of, um, what it was like to, you know, the, the, the scary aspect, the emotional aspect reminded me of what it was like when, unfortunately, you know, when we lose someone, when we're at someone's deathbed, it's very emotional. It's very intense. It's like everyday life stops for a minute and birth and death are like that. Something intense is really happening. Right. So that's what, what, um, kind of fascinates me. And I've always said, like, if I had another lifetime, I would be a doula. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really just interested in witnessing it. Um, so when the pandemic happened, if that had not happened, I don't think I would have gotten into this subject matter. I no longer could have people sit for me with my breast chest, chest portrait project. And I was doing altar paintings, but then in an altar painting, I ended up putting some photographs of birth, especially I think the first, well, there was around the same time, there were several altar paintings that had photographs, both of birth that I found on the internet and artists' representations of birth. Um, and then I realized that I just wanted to paint just the birth and people started giving me their birth photos, either themselves giving birth or themselves being born, um, as did Jean Vaccaro, the wonderful um, writer and curator who um, happened to live near me um, in upstate New York and her parents brought a beautiful printed photograph of that her father had taken of Jean being born, um, which I used as a foundation for a painting. So um, 
Yeah, it, it sort of happened because of the pandemic and also because I think of all the intense death that was going on in the pandemic. Um, it made it made this this intense, almost like dark energy of life and death kind of come to the surface in my studio. You mentioned the the torso or the chest portraits, and th that work is actually how I first became became aware. About the project a little bit and how these two are in dialogue. Um, yeah, sure. That that project started a long time ago in the um, kind of like 1997, I guess. Um, and actually in the monograph that, that we're doing a book launch tomorrow, I, I have a personal essay describing exactly kind of how that project started. Um, and, um, you know, that is very much about the model and the model's experience being paramount not so much the product. So it's a lot about exchange, a lot about documenting the process of portrait sitting um, through the portrait. So it's interesting because I've always been interested in portraiture and I didn't think the births were gonna be portraits, but that's that little baby head there is Jean Vaccaro being born, if anybody knows Jean Vaccaro. So one of the things like in the book, Jean and I have a conversation and I start the conversation by saying, um, I'd like to start by asking you about the painting I did of you being born. Um, and we have this conversation about like what it meant to she, to her. And um, she has some really interesting thoughts. But one thing she pointed out is that, you know, um, like for the, the torso portraits, there's no head, right? So there's something being kind of held back, um, which I think of as kind of like a queer refusal. And for these, when you see a head, it's not where you expect it to be. It's down below instead of up high. So she she was talking. So I, I guess what we what we realized in our conversation was that I am interested in disorienting our sense of the body spatially. And to me, that feels kind of like really important and, and like a queer thing. Um, Very much so. Sarah Ahmed said, uh, sometimes we must experience disorientation in order to become oriented. Mm. I love that. Sure. And also, just to bring up another queer theorist, you mentioned queer refusal, right? And I think that that part of my, you know, refusal of of, uh, of, of birth um, it is, you know, Lee Edelman's publication of Future, which I read during grad school and, you know, where he writes about this, like the heteronormative investment in the future manifests itself through the child, through reproduction. And of course, the threat of queerness is that we don't reproduce. And then the AIDS crisis just showed that our, our sex leads not to, to birth, but to death, right? And, um, and instead of, um, instead of trying to save the planet or, or think about other living beings, right? A heteronormative society has this obsession with reproduction and particularly biological reproduction as a way as a way of having a future um do you have any thoughts on, on on that well I love that you told me about it I didn't know about that and I and I just like read a summary of it but I ordered the book and now I'm going to read it so thank you for that I mean, the whole point of doing anything is to learn I feel um and so yeah. this is a treat to be able to like talk with you because when I feel like when I make things I don't really know what I'm doing or I don't know what it's about and then it's through the showing of it and the conversations that I kind of learn. Um, and so I, I think that's really interesting. I mean, you know, I have a dog that I love very much and I have um, a snugget, they call it. It's like a dog carrier. And I went to the grocery store once, um, didn't want them to know I had the dog. So I kind of put the snugget under my coat um, and um, people thought it was a baby. And I have never mm -hmm. experienced so much love from strangers in my life. It was almost upsetting because people were beaming at me. They were so happy to see me carrying a baby that, that I find that disturbing, even as I'm telling you this now. It was almost like I got a window into what fulfilling the, the heteronormative reproductive, reproductive function actually does give people. There is a cultural reward, as we all know, right? And it's intense. Um, 
I think as queer people, and Sarah Ahmed writes about this a lot, there's just this kind of like invisibility, especially for lesbians. You know, our lives don't seem quite as important as the heterosexual people in our family who are reproducing. And it's just the things that matter to us aren't the same things that matter to them. And um, and these things often go kind of undiscussed and unacknowledged. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. We have an entirely different value system. And actually, particularly in relation to dogs, Cassie Packard wrote a beautiful essay for the February issue part of my critics page, um, Captives of Heartbreak, where, where she writes about her dog Beckett, right, and her relationship with her dog. Um, and, you know, there, there are also so many parallels between animal theory and queer theory, right, because these are both groups that that exist in some way outside of society. Um, yes, it, this is, it makes me think of, a, I had this really funny experience last summer on the subway where I was going to the Rockaways a lot and I had my bike and I was carrying my bike off like a subway stairs and this guy walked by and probably high and he looked at me and he was like, that's really nice horse you have there. And I somehow felt so seen. I was like, you know what? Yes, this bike is my horse. And I don't know why, but it was, um, it was a queer experience. Yeah, I love that. That is so great. Um, so the other um, the other works in this show are your altar paintings. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about those and how those are connected to the crowning series? Yeah, for, well, the, the altars have been, I've been doing these altar paintings. The first one was in like 1999 to 2000. And I just painted a painting of my personal altar at home. And then I kind of didn't do another one until 2019. And then it just like caught. And I realized that it was a way of not only expressing my own kind of spiritual cosmology and my, um, you know, lineage of feminist and queer and trans art and activist, um, you know, um, involvements, but also a way of, um, you know, it's also a still life. It's also a trompe still life. And so it's like in that way, it's like this really kind of almost old tradition. Um, and for this show, I um, I specifically was interested in, in um, altars that would speak to the crownings. So altars mm -hmm. that are circular. Um, all, this one fire altar is, is about these intense colors that I associate in this show with birth, you know. Um, it's about blood, it's about like hot pink, it's about the earth, like, um, and it actually was this, it followed another altar I did called Altar for Femme Joy, which was a, a lighter pink altar with more about the pink triangle symbol. Um, so, and this one is Altar for LC, which is um, inspired by the artist Liz Collins and her wonderful textiles. So there's several textiles of hers that she designed that are in this as well as just a kind of an homage to queer, uh, you know, queer art and craft and activism. And, uh, you know, and, and that's something that Liz is interested in as well. So yeah, it's really, it's sort of about community. I, I love to kind of like take things that people give me or just reproduce other people's art in the altars. Um, but this photograph is what made me think about the humor aspect and the campiness, like, it's like, can we lighten up a little bit here? <laughs> you know, like there's a lot of seriousness and and, and stuff around, around this subject matter. And um, you were telling me that you were gonna bring Holly Hughes to the opening and that, that didn't end up happening. But I remembered that when I was in college, I wrote an essay on lesbian humor that had Holly Hughes in it. So I am really interested in our perspective and the humor that comes out of that. So for me, there's a distance here, like, I, I have a distance from birth that enables me to have to do these paintings. I don't know that I would be doing these paintings if I had like given birth or if I was more close to the subject matter. So I think there's almost mm -hmm. queer outside an outsider stance that I have here. Um, and 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 also I love this because it's Trump Loy and it's this idea of kind of something busting out of the picture plane. Mm -hmm. Uh, this brings up two things. Firstly, I, I, I'm curious to know what your conversations have been um, with people who have given birth about these paintings. 
Uh, and then secondly, on the topic of Trump Loy, um, I am curious about your art historical references for this work. Um, and for your practice. Yeah. Um, well, I'll start with the, the people who have given birth. I think I have had some contentious conversations with people who have given birth, who have a sort of authoritative attitude about it um, and a very unexamined, um, kind of an unexamined uh, point of view, privileged point of view as a like usually cis heterosexual person um, where I feel like they are critiquing, it's not this, that's not the best position for that or that mine was different, mine wasn't this way. And so I've learned to just say, um, these are paintings and I'm actually thinking more about like Judith slaying Holofernes and the, 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 the sort mm -hmm. of like long history of, of, of painting and blood and fluids and painting um, and the body. Or Saturn. Or, huh? Saturn eating the baby. Right. Exactly. There's an irreverence <laughs> here. And there's also just like a lot of references to, you know, the history of painting and it's not all about like it's not so literal it's not here and now however i mean it's i think it's also a really transformative experience for people in a very emotional and intense one and a lot of people have trauma associated with that and so i think whatever reactions people want to have is great i'm just glad people are engaging with it um but i do sometimes have to say these are paintings and um you know that's really how I'm thinking of them as paintings. And like you were saying too, um, they're not even really just about birth in a, in a way. Like, you know, the thing that really made me connect with, with the idea of birth as a subject matter actually wasn't Judy Chicago. Um, it was, or, or, or artists that are coming from a more feminist point of view. It was seeing um, artists like Louis Fertino and uh, Jonathan Lyndon Chase depicting, hmm birth fantasies in their work and reading Detransition Baby by Tori Peters and thinking about birth as conceptual, as something we all have a connection to that is not about our, our biological body or our gender identity. That was when it really felt like I could connect to the subject matter. Yeah, I saw this meme. It was for like a trans comedy show and uh, somebody said, we were all once trapped in a woman's body. Maybe a woman's body, maybe not, <laughs> you know? Exactly. You know, right. they were joking. Okay. Um, do you know the story of your birth? Um, I don't know much about it. No, actually, no. Do you? I mean, it's an interesting question. Well, there's no documentary, which is maybe why I'm so bitter about children is because there's very little documentation of, of, of me as a child but but I do know the story which is actually that uh the first McDonald's had just opened in Moscow um it was still the Soviet Union but the first McDonald's had opened and my mother went to eat um and she ate so much that a few hours later she went into labor so she likes to say that I'm a McDonald's baby oh that's so sweet <laughs> but then she also says that if she, if she could do it, if she could live her life over, she would not have children. So, <laughs> um, oh. but, but yeah, yeah, that that is the story. The Trump Loy question. I guess I kind of just I I love painting as Trump Loy. I love like you know um, Renaissance painting. Mm -hmm. Paintings are on walls and how they're made to look spatially, like they're part of the room. You know, like. Um, Veronese or like Titian, you know, mm -hmm. people standing behind a column on the wall looking at you and they're spatially, realistically positioned as if they were really there or scenes that let you see outside of a space. I actually used to do, um, you know, internal murals for people like inside their homes. And I've just always been interested in that kind of that primal idea of art in a space on a wall in relation to the viewer and how it can kind of mess with your idea of what's real, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So do you think, are you going to continue this body of work? Um, or is there, what is the next step? With I this? am, I mean, 
now I have three bodies of work going that I'm very engaged in the altars, the torsos and the crownings. And I don't mm -hmm. see a reason to stop any of them. I think I'm just going to be very busy. Actually, now that we're looking at this, I wanted to ask you about this heart shaped canvas. What made you, what made you decide to have a heart shaped well, portal? I mean, I've always loved Miriam Shapiro's big hearts. I, I love the cliche of a heart in, in, in art is hilarious. I mean, Jim Dine did all these hearts and I love that you can do anything in art. You can be a huge cliche and you can still do it and try to make something interesting out of it. Um, but I think it really also came out of the pandemic. Like I was engaging with somebody who made canvases that I had never engaged with before because everything changed because of the pandemic. And he was just saying, I can do any shapes. And it was like really inexpensive. And I was like, okay, let's try some hearts. I mean, I like hearts, <laughs> but you know, if you want to get more scholarly about it, Leah Devon writes beautifully in the book about the meaning of the heart, the vulva, um, you know, medieval art um, and, you know, Jesus's side wound and the idea of, of like, yeah, a sort of, uh, a maternal father figure. I mean, the idea of a non-binary, um, you know, a very early non-binary um, existence in art. Is, yeah. is, she writes about that, which is really interesting. Yeah, I, and it's something, uh, I wrote about this a little bit in my dissertation too, that, um, you know, first, first of all, the wound of Jesus being depicted as a vagina and it, throughout art history, the the more Jesus is in pain, the more feminized he is depicted, right? The more feminized he becomes. So to be wounded is to be feminine. Mm -hmm. Um and and then there has been this like long um historical belief since the Middle Ages, and Leah will probably know better than me, but that um the female has two mouths, mm -hmm. the lower mouth and the upper mouth. And through both of these orifices she leaks uncontrollably um and it's like very disturbing to men because you know this like well Christeva the abject right conflating this inside and outside and and this this fear of like the bleeding the bleeding mouth right and then when and then you get into sexuality and you get into like if your sexuality involves you know vulvas you're going to be dealing with a lot of that in your sex life. You know, you're going to be dealing. <laughs> this is like part of what I'm interested in as a, um, like a, a lesbian artist is like my erotic experience, my personal experience, my romantic experience, my community experience. How does it influence the work? I mean, um, you know, my ex, my ex had a baby and I was sitting there going, damn, I can't believe it. My ex had a baby. Like, you know, <laughs> How did that, you know, to me, there's a certain like um, fascination with it really. Um, and I think that it's not surprising that a lesbian would be interested in exploring what the vagina can do. A, a lot of times in birth, the vagina ends up projecting out as something's coming out and becoming almost phallic. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, to me, I'm not, I'm, because this is my sexuality, it doesn't really gross me out too, so very much, um, you know, and that's part of it. Like, I think there's something sexy about it. Yes, yes. And, and something pornographic in like, I use that as a compliment. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and this also brings me to a question that um, maybe I've even asked you before, but you know, as somebody who has been making art for a long time now and often engages with, um, you know, the female body, the queer body, um, there, I've, I've heard so many artists um, of your generation say that um, already in art school, you know, they were, they were really discouraged from, um, pursuing this type of imagery because it would be co-opted co-opted by the male gaze and also you know do not by no means fragment the body because that is inherently violent um and uh ideally uh please avoid the female body uh, yes 
altogether, uh, but it's okay to paint men. Um, what has your what has your experience been with that? Well, I think that like uh, second wave um, feminist artists um, like you know Joan Semmel were rebelling against being told not to paint because in painting is inherently patriarchal and and stuff like that. So, um, but I think in my generation, which is really the '90s, you know, the AIDS crisis was happening. There was a lot of art about the body. There was a lot of art about abjection. Um, there was a lot of art about queerness. Um, so, and I, and I wasn't really a part of the art world. Like I had like a different path in my, in my twenties. So I was literally just doing my thing, you know, in different places. I wasn't in New York. I was just doing my thing and, um, and it, and it was able to develop without anybody telling me you can't do that. But that's another thing about being queer. We don't, I don't respond well to, you can't do that. You know, we create our own reality. We create our own culture. We create possibilities for ourselves that other people can't even imagine. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I, um, even with this body of work, I was a little, a little bit like nervous to bring it out because people, there were so many warnings given to me by people. And I, by whom? Been, oh, like people uh, in the anybody who saw the work. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, you know, just I mean maybe people who just saw it from a more like one dimensional point of view, you know? Yeah. Um, and what was the warning? Hmm? The warning what was, was the warning? Oh, this is, is going to be very controversial. Um, this isn't the right time for this. Like all these things. Um, this is going to be, you know, put on your seatbelt. This is going to be really hard to put out in the world. And actually so far, I'm amazed at how quickly people's, even if they are initially maybe a little bit like put off or something, the the amount of time it takes for people to kind of come around is very short often. And there's been a lot Mm -hmm. more interesting of the work. And I was also worried that the queer and trans community wouldn't see it as queer because they would be seen as heterosexual. Like, because birth is is an image that is very like coded as heterosexual um, and and that it would only be seen as feminist, but not queer. And that is not Mm -hmm. happening at all. Like it's been, I haven't had to explain anything to anybody in that, in that way. And it's actually been the queer and trans community that have been the most supportive of this work. And that, Mm. that sort of second wave feminist attitude of you can't fragment the body, it's violent, all this stuff. Those people have been the ones who have been the most opposed to my work throughout my whole life, actually. Um, And um, well, but I think that 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 is the generation that then started telling a younger generation not not to do it because yeah. you know I've had I've had this conversation with Judy Bamber who in 1994 made this this series of really close up hyper realistic vagina paintings, um, right? And she was telling me how how discouraged she was from from pursuing any of that. Right, right. That's interesting. I think you sent me, you told me about this show that I hadn't known about. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a sexual, yeah. Jones did the sexual politics show that, that, that explores, that explores this and, and, and exactly as you say, this return of, of the body in the nineties, but, but from, mm, from a more conceptual angle. And, and of course, Zoe Leonard did the documenta installation in 1992. Um, yeah, there's so much here. And and actually and, and who are some who are some um artists because I know you mentioned Frida Kahlo, Carmen Wynand. How do you pronounce we not Wynand? Um who are some of the artists that uh who have also depicted birth that yeah. you've been informed? Well I love Frida Kahlo's my birth. That is like the mm-hmm. you know, for me that's like the the best, yeah. you know, of all time. Um and then um Carmen Wynant's installation at MoMA was I didn't see it in person but I saw pictures and that was really fascinating Haji Shin's photographs that were in the Whitney Biennial some years back those are beautiful um let's see um wait is Frida birth to herself in this painting I don't remember I think it's called my birth and it's just this body on a bed with a head coming out and I think it's it's about her being born okay but she's not giving birth to herself no because did you see this? Movie? Did you see the movie Poor Things? Yeah. 
Okay, so you know how then there's a scene, I'm sorry, anyone who hasn't seen it, spoilers. And, and he says to her towards the end, he says, you are both the mother and the baby. Oh, that's right. Oh, that was so interesting. So yes. But then I'm reading Barth, and at some point he says something very similar too. Um, so yeah, this idea that you can be both, both that you can be both. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. When, it, when you're doing a painting of someone being born too, like it's it's is it a painting of the person being born or is it the the person you know giving birth and that's another interesting thing too about about like the philosophy of the body that I found interesting like you know the original philosophy of the body was this idea of this unified you know body that houses the soul right that is like base as as compared to the soul and and the reality is like um, if you actually take AFAB people into account. Um, you can have two subjectivities in one body. I mean, just for a start, that's that's kind of mind blowing, and that's not something that like mainstream ph philosophy really, you know, even acknowledged for so long. Mm -hmm. So these smaller scale ones, how do you how do you navigate um, what scale? Because you these are really across a wide range of very small ones and and larger than life. Um, so. What were your artistic decisions behind that? Um, so these are five in five by five inches. So they're quite small. They're smaller than most postcards. Um, and I just love miniature painting. Um, and I I love the idea of making something that is um, often seen as, you know, something sort of like too terrible to to look at, and and to see it as small and precious and intimate and almost gem like. Um, so that's, I definitely am interested in sort of, um, playing up that, that, that beauty aspect. And I think when things are small, you can really do that in some ways more. It's, it's different from when it's large and enveloping, it becomes this kind of intimate thing where you have to go towards it. Um, yeah. yeah. Like, a relic. like a what? Something like a relic. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, Clarity, you're, you know, when you were talking about people warning you of how it would be received, um, I was also thinking, um, you know, I know that your work has faced and continues to face so much censorship, particularly on Instagram. And actually one of the first conversations you and I had was, uh, about Yulia Tsvetkova. I think this was 2019, the queer feminist Russian artist who was making very body positive drawings of vaginas and then facing seven years in jail. And actually she recently left Russia, so that's good. Um, and so how um, how has that been for you? Uh, and what's it like to keep making work when you're under such constant censorship? Um, you know, I, I was thinking about actually, you know, um, the culture wars of the nineties and late eighties and how you know, big things happened, like, um, and that's happening now again, too, actually. Um, you knew that, that censorship was happening. A show would be canceled. But with, with Instagram, you don't actually know. It's like there's a lot of self-censorship. There's a lot of people just mm -hmm. deciding not to post something to be safe. There's um, shadow banning. There's restricting the, of the reach of people's accounts. So you, so I can't, I can't say exactly how it's affected my career um but i know that it has you know and um but it's a quiet thing and it's almost like a gaslighting thing it's not transparent nobody's admitting it um and nobody's quantifying it so it's it's really odd and there's there's not that much concern in the mainstream art world like you don't hear podcasts talking about it a lot or articles it's like if it doesn't affect you it's just like whatever but it really affects marginalized artists more you know it affects like artists who do, you know portray bodies that are not you know the the beauty ideal or um artists that are queer trans of color um feminist art so it's a real problem and it continues to be although it's changed form my work used to constantly be taken down and now it's mm -hmm. taken down less. but it's but it's i'm it's taken down less but my account is restricted it's just mm -hmm. restricted I think it's just not shown to a lot of people. Um, 
And, and actually in the last few days, I did have several things taken down, but they were things that people had posted of this show where they had covered like the genitals with like an emoji or something. So because you mm-hmm. couldn't, see it was a birth, I guess Instagram thought it was pornography or something. I don't know. I think it's better not to try to use digital pasties in general and just to trust that like their guidelines are that if it's painting, it should be allowed. And um, and that birth is allowed. Birth is actually censored less than torsos. The, the quote unquote female nipple is the biggest threat to our civilization today, apparently. Um, yeah, yeah, because we don't think of birth as pornographic, right? It's wholesome. Right, I guess. I, a lot of times they'll do like a warning, you know, you have to click on it to see it, but they don't take it down. Yeah, because you mentioned you were also watching a lot of YouTube videos and there's like a whole, whole Instagram community that is uh, that is obsessed with birth. Yeah. Looking at this, it, it's slightly, um, I haven't seen a torso portrait quite like this where you're, I mean, is this your intervention or um, was it the sitters? It was the sitters. Yeah, the sitter, the sitter Danny is an old friend and um, they're non-binary and they were interested in this. And they're, interestingly, they're a physician whose specialty is trans care. Um, mm-hmm. And and yet they, um, and their mask identified, but they they don't mind having breasts. So they have their breasts and they, and what I like about this is that it really bisects and, and changes the shape of the torso so that it it isn't the forms that we expect. And um, mm-hmm. in a way, I think it disrupts our expectations of um, like the gender binary. Mm-hmm. I was thinking this would be so good in a, in, a, in a group show with Harmony Hammond, whose work to me is all about bondage. Yes, it's so true. The straps and the like, yes, yeah. oh my God, let's do it. I love Harmony I'll make Hammond. it happen. Okay. Me. Um, yes. Uh, so we've been seeing a few slides um, that um, show the, the book, the new book, which I also have here. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about that and the process. And this is Genesis, right? BP mm-hmm. Orange. Um, and yeah, what was that like working on the book and the writers that contributed? Uh, which are Leah Devon and Harry Dodge and Jean Picaro. Um, am I missing someone? And you? Yeah. And you. Well, it was, it was, I learned a lot. Um, it was a, a long process and um, it was published by New Discretions. And there was a person from, um, who was like a liaison to DAP um, or DAP, Distributed Art Publishers, mm-hmm. who was produced the book. And so we all kind of learned a lot together. Um, but I was so excited mostly about um, about the writing. I mean, and so I hope anybody who gets the book actually reads it. I fought for a, a larger font and I tried to make it as just like accessible and readable as possible um, because there's a lot of gems in there. Harry Dodge is a very creative writer. Harry Dodge, I was, when I first read the essay, I thought, oh my God, this is more growth. This is more kind of shocking than the artwork. Like you just, it's very visceral, um, but it's, it's fascinating. And Leah Devon's essay is beyond brilliant, just beyond. Um, and, uh, and both are right. I mean, Harry Dodge, Megan Nelson's partner, the Argonauts, uh, I would say probably initiated this trend of, um, of, of queer, queer parenthood and um yeah that was a really influential book um and in the Argonauts actually Maggie Nelson there's a part where it says like imagine if instead of mugs with like the perfect like picture of you with your kids on it it was a picture of the child being born so actually um actually I ordered a couple of mugs this week um with my my images on them and they're going to arrive next week. And, and if it works out, we might actually order some so people can, it can, it can be like merch for the show. Cause I just love that I idea. Love um, yes. Yeah. And Harry Dodge also love- wrote 
amazing memoir called My Meteorite, in which um, he talks about like his his mother and being adopted and all this really interesting stuff that also relates to birth. Mm -hmm. That's on my list. Um, I love the spread of uh, the torso portraits with with their sitters. Yeah, this um, is and like nineteen ninety seven, basically, or eight. Yeah, and I know that I, I think Genesis is is in it twice, mm -hmm. and is the only and twice. Can I ask you just to talk a little bit about your relationship? Um, Genesis. Um, I was lucky enough to meet through Benjamin Tischer of New Discretions, and when we were on a panel together at Invisible Exports, we were in the same we were a group show together, and I saw. Genesis, Genesis's like arm and it had layers of tattoos. Like mm -hmm. I, I knew that this torso told a story. And so I wanted to, um, to paint her. And I asked Ben and I was like, I'm sure she would be way too busy. I'm sure she would never do this. And Ben said, oh no, I think it would be good actually. You know, she was struggling mm -hmm. with leukemia at the time. And so it ended up being really nice. I mean, she came to my studio several times and we spent you know, we spent time talking and listening to music, listening to her music and also other people's. Um, and yeah, the process of painting a portrait of a torso that tells a story that is part of that person's artwork, really, and, and the charm necklace too, it's so iconic, was really um, like a breakthrough for me in terms of the portraits. And so then it, it influenced all the ones that have come since really like um this other model al yar um made their own amazing necklace for their portrait um and um you know i'm also working on portraits now of several queer and trans artists that also make work around about their bodies so alana farrell linus borgo jonathan linden chase and wells chandler um so yeah, I love the idea of making a portrait of someone who has already made work about the body. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the stories that the marks on our bodies tell. Yeah. Um, and what is that process like? How many, like, on a very, you know, technical level, how many hours do you spend with your sitters? And are you in conversation the whole time? Or, uh, you know, I, I, I was recently painted for the first time by the amazing Angela Dufres. Oh, I never know how to yeah. Dufresne, yeah. Um, but it was such, you know, I thought that I would have to like be in the same position the whole time and that I would be uncomfortable. And instead it was such a, I was just, you know, having a glass of wine and kind of moving around the room a little bit. And uh, within, within six hours, there was a portrait of me. Um, but and um, so yeah, I, I'm I'm curious about I'm curious about your relationship to that, to that process. Yeah, it's 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 um it's a real bonding experience, you know. For the large paintings, which take a lot of time, I really get to know people because sometimes it takes several years to do a portrait. Um, but a lot of them that are smaller take less time, or especially when I was doing drawings and and pastels. But yeah, I um in the book I write a little bit about my grandmother or granny, I should be, I should say, um, who was a beautician and wrote a book called, um, actually it was a self-taught writer as well and wrote a pamphlet called The Power Behind the Comb about how to be a good beautician. And from, and I read it as a kid. And what I learned was number one, your own hair has to look good. And number two, it's all about the relationship. It is not, I mean, you, yes, the haircut, you, you know, your craft matters but it's about the conversation you're having with that customer that keeps them coming back. Um, and so I think about that with my sitters, like this is like a special, this should be a relaxing time for them, a fun time where they don't have to do anything. They can just sit there and they can talk if they feel like it or not, if they don't. And I want it to be like a safe space, a fun space, you know, something mm -hmm. that's, that's fun for both of us. I love that quote from your granny. I'm gonna think about that. Wonderful. Um, I have one last question before I think we should open it up to to the audience is that um, something that you and I share is that 
were really holding on to to the promise of the term lesbian, right? Uh, when so many people are are moving away from it and it's considered outdated and you know very <clears throat> easily equated with separatism and essentialism and um, you know as you know I have a real commitment to uh, in my scholarship really showing how lesbian was queer before queer and that lesbian comes in many genders and um, I don't know I just wanted to hold some space for you to share your thoughts on that and and why you are holding on to the promise of that word. Um, I definitely don't hold on to um, turf ideology. I, I reject that uh, utterly. And I think there's a lot of that still hanging around and it's really dangerous. Um, however, you know, I was involved in the lesbian Avengers in the early nineties. We did these amazing creative actions, you know? And I think there's an ick factor with the word lesbian, sort of like there's an ick factor with like the vagina or with birth or with all that like maternal abjection stuff. Um, I saw some like TikTok video of like a really young Gen Z person encouraging other people of their age to just get used to saying the word lesbian. Uh -huh. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think yeah. it's I think it's cyclical. Things come in and out, and I think that um, actually Gen Z seems to be using the word more than the millennials. It's, I've noticed that with my students, especially throughout the class in the beginning you know everyone's queer and then <laughs> there is more suddenly there there's more lesbians and dyke identified and you know they just they they realize that that these terms are not mutually exclusive and and you can use you can use them together you know i'm a lesbian yeah. dyke faggot exactly and you can be creative and have fun with it and you know we can all reject um we can all be feminists and we can also reject the gender binary and we can yeah. continue to chart freedom, you know, and um, liberation in all the new forms and words that that entails the new flags, everything. It's all a progression. Um, yeah. You know, and sometimes yeah. people don't see that. And then there's this generational conflict and I'm Gen X. So I'm like caught in the middle and I'm like, can I help explain to one another, you know, can I help explain to the really old people what's happening here? Um, because it, it it's sad to me that there's like, this clash, this misunderstanding between generations when really we're all standing on each other's shoulders, you know, That's and it. making progress yeah. together. Yeah, we all want to rebel against our, our ancestors in a way uh, and reinvent the wheel. Um, but yeah, I'm impressed that you know the letter for your generation. I'm like, is there a document for that? Because I don't know what letter my generation would be. Oh, how old are you? You can Google this. <laughs> Nobody knows about Gen X, but we were actually a generation in between the boomers and uh, the millennials. And we were mm. children and we were neglected. And so I we're really sure about the fact that nobody knows who we are. <laughs> what? I may be a millennial. I think you're a millennial, maybe. I'll look this up later. So but, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi, Shelley. <laughs> Um, I will end with, with, with an, another quote by Sarah Ahmed, uh, in living a feminist life, you know, she says, uh, to, to be a feminist is to approach everything as something that is questionable. Mm -hmm. That's a great, um, definition of feminism that, that moves away from womanhood or even gender altogether. Yeah. Clarity, thank you so much so i know that we will be in such conversation. a and you will be in conversation again tomorrow with leah and um Benjamin. at new discretion and 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 jean um so jean, those yeah. of you be there unfortunately but yeah we'll be and you can see the show if you come to the book launch because it's going to be in the gallery 6 to 8 p.m tomorrow night all right, thank you. And let's open up, open it up for questions. I have loved listening to this. Thank you both so, so much for your dialogue. Um, it's been such a pleasure. Um, we have a couple of questions, but if anyone in the audience has a question, feel free to post it in the chat. Um, I will turn over the mic to you when it's time. The first question is going to be from Babs. Babs, I'll give you the chance to unmute. 
Hi, everybody. Um, congratulations, Clarity. It's uh, so nice to see you here um, and uh, love this conversation. So my question is, uh, I was fascinated by your remark where you're talking about the concern for the acceptance of the work and how you were getting all these warnings that it wouldn't be accepted. And um, do you think that the acceptance has anything to do with the community that you have built? Well, actually, yeah, I think so. I mean, I saw that at the opening. It was a very, very loving, queer, artistic community. And um, and it was trans and it was multiracial and it was just full of love. And that really made me realize just too, like the importance of community, like especially in the art world when there's so much competition and money's involved and all these things that make things more complicated, you know? Um, yeah, creating community is is everything. Thank Thanks you. For that question, Bab. Um, Babs, thank you so much um, for that answer, Clarity. Um, I have a question for you. Uh, I am curious about the, you know, I know with your torso paintings, um, you often are in dialogue with with someone in in real life. And I'm curious what the transition to working with photography was like for you, um, especially because there's often such a trace of the photograph and so much nostalgia and memory wrapped up in working with photographs. So I was curious how yeah. that was. So interesting. I think it it does become more about time, you know, like talking to Jean Vaccaro and thinking about what was going on when she was born in 1981, you know, what was going on with with queer politics and with AIDS and with her mother living near Stonewall and all these things. Um, and often people send me birthing photos and sometimes I can really see like, oh, that must have been taken in the 80s. It has that golden look, that kind of like fuzzy quality, you know, that was a real film camera. I mean, I'm interested in, in photographs for that reason and documentation, but, but it also opens it up to more imagination for me and more kind of like interpretation because I don't want to copy a photograph. I mean, it's, it's a copyright issue really for stuff that you find on the internet, unless somebody has given me a photograph very, you know, but even then I often really just want to mess around and change the colors and, and change the composition. And sometimes I'll take like, like I have, my phone has different albums of photographs on it. And one is just splatters. One is just, you know, assholes. <laughs> one is just, you know, um, um, upside down births, you know, like, so I could take like five different photographs and then make an image. And I also like to kind of do more and more invention. And I, you know, there's certain things that photographs, there's limitations that photographs have that I, try to be aware of not falling into, like this kind of extreme foreshortening that happens with photographs. Like, I don't wanna fall into those traps. And I've, you know, I've always tried to um, sort of account for that, correct for that. You really feel your imagination working its way into the paintings for sure. It's really nice to hear more about that. Um, a question just appeared in the chat that's a good follow-up to that. Um, it's from Carson Whitmore. I'm curious about this as well. I'm wondering what comes up in conversation about the role of these photographs in people's lives, how these depictions of birth exist for the people who are lending them to your work. And you've talked a little bit about that, but I wonder if there are any other stories you might want to share about that. Yeah, I mean, weirdly, this is another connection with the Torso Project, as I think it's sort of about combating shame. Um, like people are like, somebody came to the opening who had sent me a birthing photo and was really disappointed that I hadn't used it like of herself giving birth underwater. And I will try to get to it at some point, but like, you know, it was like they wanted, she wanted it to be represented. There was an enthusiasm there and a pride, you know? And um, there's also someone whose photograph I used in the big um, blood altar. And there's two of them actually from her that she sent me and her daughter is now an adult. So every time birth altar gets posted on Instagram, she'll mention her, she'll like mention her daughter and be like, check yourself out there, <laughs> you know? Um, and, you know, with the torso portraits as well for the sitters, it was often about, about like um, rejecting this mantle of shame that had been given them for whatever aspect of their body they were taught to feel ashamed of. So for this too, I feel like 
people who have given birth, like that's pretty badass, you know? And why are, why is it also then coming with a dose of like, this is so close. Ooh, you should be ashamed. Like, I can't think, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. So yeah. Thank you for that question, um, Carson. That was a great, great question. I'm going to be selfish and ask you one more question that I'm somewhat curious about because in reading Harry Dodge's essay, um, there's so much mystery around the act of birth. Like there's so much that, um, you know, friends of mine who have given birth, they'll be talking to me about it and I'll be like, I have never learned any of this. I have never heard any of this until a close peer is going through this process, which is very interesting to me um, and says a lot about culture and society and life. And I'm curious how you think of these works relative to that narrative and relative to that lack of information existing in in day-to-day -day life. Yeah, I mean, I, I have this impulse to make visible what I don't see. Mm -hmm. um, and I always have. Um, so it's like this this way of saying like, okay, so this doesn't exist yet, but we now are going to make space for something new and people's attitudes can change as a result of this. And um, so that's kind of how I feel about it. You know, um, it is weird. It's really weird. Um, like, but I think it's tied to like, you know, like that shame thing that I'm talking about, you know, that thing that has to do with um, this very like misogynistic um, conception of the body. And like one of the things I talked about with Jean Vaccaro too in the book is like, what aspect of bodies have been canonized and allowed to be shown in art history, you know, and what have not. Um, she, you know, she said, imagine if you went into an art museum and instead of these statues they have like, you know, naked um, chiseled men, we saw like representations of birth, like what would that shift for us? Um, and I find that really interesting. I love that. We we have one more question um, and I'm going to see if Kyungo would like to be unmuted to ask you directly. I'll give you the chance to, otherwise I can just read it. Okay, I will just read it. Um, as someone who is, or wait a minute, one moment. We have several questions actually, if you'll have them clarity. Um, sure. From Kianga, Clarity, we communicated about my feeling these paintings are like parables about the historical moment. I'm preoccupied with end of empire themes and the emergence of a new era, monetary system, politically. And we are all existing at a profound multi-generational crossroad of something being birthed. Can you comment on that? <laughs> That's um, wonderful. I love that these paintings can be a metaphor for that. You know, I love that because it's a conceptual interpretation and it's so hopeful too. And it's not a future that is predicated on, um, you know, literal children or reproduction. It's a future that is predicated on our cultural evolution. So that's really exciting. I love that, those words that you shared. Thank you, Kianga. And thank you for everything that you do in life. You're incredible. Okay, and there's one more here from Alana. Your skin tones in the Breast Portrait Project have been incredibly true to life. There is an electric vibrancy to your birth paintings. Is this chosen or influenced by the photograph and has your palette changed in working on these new works? Um, I don't know that the photographs have really influenced too much in terms of the skin tones, um, but um, I do think the palette has shifted in this work it's gotten much more kind of um electric of sorts you know um there's a lot more bright kind of like red and hot pink and like a kind of glowy quality um which is almost like maybe you could think about volcanoes or something but also um yeah i think that maybe there's something a little bit well i mean if you just look at images of birth there's just there's there's not just red blood but there's green there's yellow there's what there's different kinds of fluids and um so that's where that comes from I think my interest but thank you 
Thank you everyone for all your questions. Um, really, really great questions. And thank you, Clarity, for answering these questions. Um, we are going to conclude today with a reading. And so I'm going to pass it back over to Ksenia to close us out with a poetry reading. Thank you so much. Um, really excited to read something. So I was um, in the in these someone's house archives the other day. Uh, it's called Fugitive Materials, and they had just received like boxes of um, this um, uh, woman who was a lesbian uh, collection, and there were a lot of uh, random like poetry zines almost. Um, this one this one was from 1972. And it's it was titled Eating Artichokes. Um, this is what it looked like. And it's by someone who I'd never heard of before, Willis Kim. And so I'm going to read the first poem, uh, which is about eating artichokes. Eating artichokes is like um, very special. Let your tongue savor each moist, tender petal white teeth gummy with this green vegetarian honey. And when you have worked your way down to the core, the heart, the damn jewel of the matter, smile. This, this is the ultimate ecstasy. Fact number one, your entire artichoke can become a very heavy sexual fantasy. That's it. Thank you so much, Ksenia. That was a perfect way to conclude. 1972. 1972. 1972. Um, thank you, Ksenia. Thank you, Clarity, so, so much for today's conversation. Um, and thank you to Ben at New Discretions for all your support in preparing the slides for today. Thank you to the Terra Foundation for American Art who sponsor our new social environment program and make weekday conversations like this one possible. You can support our archive. Um, you can. Uh, they also support our growing archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel and where this video will be shortly. The Rail has been free and independent for 23 years. A donation directly supports our writers, our production staff, and our operations. You can support our work through the link in the chat. And if you're free on Monday at 1 p.m., join us for a conversation with Julia and Anne-Marie Rooney on the occasion of their exhibition In the Weather of It at Below Grand, curated by Amanda Millet Sorsa. They'll be in dialogue with Ginevra de Blasio. And as is real tradition, you can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so, so much for being here today. It was great to see everyone. Goodbye. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, 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 Thank Super congrats. That's clarity. It's such a <laughs> go see the show, everybody, and buy the books. Everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much.